I don't think it would surprise you to know that Jesus calls us to love others. And most of us want to do that. Most of us do it all the time. We love others who are our friends, who are our family, who treat us well. We love those people. But today Jesus says, that's good, but that's not quite enough. And he calls us to love other kinds of people. Well, if you, like me, struggle with that at all, you'll understand why I call this the hardest command. Welcome to this DVD presentation of our sermon here at FPC. And I hope that I get a chance to meet you sometime soon here at First Presbyterian Church. God bless. And, two. and that is that uh, Friday night, I got a call and had the uh, privilege of go going over to Susan McDaniel's house. I don't know if Susan, should she step out? Okay. Um, and Susan uh, has been the caretaker, has had her niece with her uh, for the last month while she was in recovery. And uh, that niece, Friday night, passed away, uh, tragically. She was 28 years old. She leaves behind a four-year-old daughter. And so one of the things Susan said is, but I have a church family, don't I? And we are her family gathered around her. I know that so many of you would be glad to bring food and that sort of thing. She said she doesn't need food, but uh, she needs our love and care. So why don't we lift up the McDaniel family right now in prayer? Lord God, we ask that you would be a hedge of protection around this family that has now suffered a broken heart and a terrible loss. And God, we lift up the McDaniels who are part of our church family. And we also lift up the entire extended family. Katie's mother, who has now lost a daughter. And for this little girl, that she might know your love as she grows up. And she might understand that your embrace has been true for herself and for her mother. God, we pray that you would not only protect this family, but all who are touched by tragedies like this or who are in danger of that. God, would you speak to the hearts of those who are on the edge and bring them back just a little bit that they might know your love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, you get an idea of what my message will be about uh, from the children's message. Great little actors, weren't they? I didn't have any prep for that. I love Bailey's hamming it. The other day I was at Fred Meyer's and I had a little spare time. I was waiting for the bank to open and uh, so I wandered through the little... Um, uh, electronics section where they have all these DVDs and uh, I was looking at these DVDs and I was amazed at how many DVDs essentially show a guy with a big old gun on the front of the DVD. I throw a couple pictures up here. Here's my former governor right here. Uh, you know, that's going to solve it all. Uh, let's see. Let's see a couple. There they are. He's unhappy. Can you tell? He's unhappy too. Another one. Uh, more. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of shooting going on in the movies. And uh, I know that's a shock to you. You did not know that at all, did you? Well, movie after movie after movie is proposing a pretty neat solution to the problem of dealing with people that you don't really like. And that's a solution, right? You just wipe them out. Fantastic. Solves everything. I don't know who does the cleanup, but it doesn't matter in the movies. Well, as a matter of fact, you might recall this interesting pair, Uncle Fred and his, great, his niece Priscilla Ann. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had them joining us in our amateur video series where uh, I play Uncle Fred. Someone told me I should remind you I'm not really like Uncle Fred if you're a visitor. But in any case, um, and he has been, he got surprised by Priscilla Ann coming to visit him for a month. Well, now the month has come to the, come more or less to the end. And in fact, uh, even despite his own attitude and best wishes, it turns out Uncle Fred actually liked his time with Priscilla Ann. And so his suggestion is that perhaps they should go to a movie together. Just wait a second, young lady. I know you were excited to get here, but, but we're going to see a movie. Now, it's been 30 days. And you're just about to go back to my blessed sister. But before we go, we should see a movie. But Uncle Fred, I've been here for 30 days. This is 
a great movie. What do you think about this one? The Lego Movie. I've heard it's fantastic. It looks fantastic. What do you think? Uh, this frozen. Is a Disney. It's 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 you know really animals like, cold. No no no. No, but it's more of the you know G. It's it's a little more respectable. Uh, yeah, not yeah, quite yeah. as violent. Speaking of respect. One thing we respect is our military. This looks good. I mean, I understand there are a lot of bad wiped out. It's a really intense, and of course, some of our own soldiers die, and I hate that. But a lot of bad guys go down, but, and that's how I want life to be. But, I want the bad guys to get it. Oh my goodness, Uncle Fred, what has got into you? I mean, this is going to be bloody and violent. I might have nightmares. Yeah, is but, that really what you want me to do? Is go home to my mom with nightmares? Well. I would think you'd feel good to know that the bad guys are taken care of and they're done. But what about Jesus? I thought Jesus loves everyone. Oh, you would bring Jesus up. Well, listen, I don't know exactly how to do this. I always wish that I could just wipe out the bad guys, but, well, I guess maybe I have to think about it. That sounds like a great idea. Let's, let's go see Frozen. Let's go see Frozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> This is the end in our series of brilliant video clips. <laughs> that Priscilla Ann is such a peacenik. And we can all relate, I think, to Uncle Fred. He likes, as, I, as was said several times, likes the bad guys to get it in the end. And probably that's because, in real life, it seems kind of rare that's what happens. Well, Jesus, as you might have guessed by now, has a different approach. Listen to God's word. But to you who are listening, it's interesting, isn't it? But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. May we pray. And now, God, let your word speak its truth for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In preparing for this message, I read an article that sort of detailed virtually every major religion in the world and most philosophies and said every one of these has this principle of reciprocity. In the Hammurabi Code of old, we all know it, it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a, new, for a tooth, so it's kind of a parallel thing. And there is a person named Hillel who was a contemporary of Jesus who was asked to sum up the Torah. And he answered in this way, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. I love that. Go and learn. Get out of my face. The golden rule, standing by itself, says the same thing in the positive. We are to think of others and how they might feel and treat them like they want to be treated. And I'd say fair enough. 
But what we just read goes much further. If they are your enemy, if they hate, if they curse, if they mistreat you, love them. Pray for them. If they slap you, ask if they'd like to try the other side as well. If they steal from you, offer the rest of your outfit so they could have the full ensemble. And don't expect it is coming back. Ditto for money that you lend. Otherwise, he says, it's just standard business practice. You scratch my back and I scratch yours. Even sinners do that, Jesus says. Love them, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Because that is how God is. And his children, and as his children, I should say, he wants us to have a family resemblance. So Tuesday night, Cindy and I get a text. Our son was in a car wreck several weeks ago. No one was hurt. But the text says he needs $700 tomorrow by 10 o'clock. That would be the $400 for the tow and the $300 the yard was charging him while he spent time paying no attention to that detail. And his challenge is that he has $2 in his bank account. These are the moments that try parents' souls, are they not? <laughs> and I am thinking all kinds of dad thoughts. I'm thinking, how could you possibly have so little money? I'm thinking, do you know the difference between a hobby and a job? It's pay. They're not paying you enough. Get a real job. All those things are occurring with grace, of course, in my heart. <laughs> And as I have all these thoughts, I am looking to my text for this Sunday. And this Sunday, the text says, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. <laughs> and I said, oh, Lord, I had that one figured out. <laughs> In fact, I went further with the Lord. I said, Lord, I really do, appreciating, I really do appreciate you building these sermon illustrations into my life, but at this rate, it is going to kill me, Lord, so please, no more $700 illustrations. One commentator said that that is really Jesus' point here. That is, we are to treat everyone else like family. People in your family, they cross the line. They say foolish things. They do the wrong things. And usually we give them a little bit longer leash than they deserve. We figure they didn't mean what they said at the time. They really, when they're better selves, wouldn't have done what they did. We lend them money and we forget it. And Jesus tells us to treat others like family. But what a messed up family. Because Jesus does not sugarcoat these people. He says, God has to put up with the, get these true terms, the ungrateful and the wicked. And it is those, it's not the cool and the kind, it's not the gracious and supportive, it's not the thoughtful and loving, it is those kinds of people who serve as the real test of the golden rule. So what he's saying is this, do unto the ungrateful and the wicked as you would have them do unto you. Of course, we say, well, what about tough love? What about the problem of enabling? We want to change their behaviors, not reward them. And how about our own boundaries? If someone slaps me or steals from me or curses me, I don't want to have them over for dinner. What's wrong with just keeping my distance? I think Jesus is using extreme language, using hyperbole to make a point. We are all schooled in keeping our distance. We all understand we need to cut off charity to the chronic abuser. But he wants us to err on the side of loving too much. Instead of doing business as usual, consider that the person who is giving us trouble 
may be facing a lot of tough things. And when we respond with love, in that moment, we represent God. And that is the holy moment. I see you're doing a second verse. Go right ahead. I told you. I told you there would be a surprise. We'll talk about that later. Have you been through this? That is, you're up to your holy moment. Good things are about, you're going to try to love someone who doesn't love you or isn't kind to you. Have you been through this where you've actually been cursed? Where you've actually experienced something awful from others? I know I have. In a former church, we were forced to contact Child Protective Services based on something that a kid said at camp. And that led to a whole cascading set of events, beginning with the CPS team saying they wanted us to not contact anyone else until that bus had returned and they had a chance to speak with the child. You know the outcome is not going to be good any way you slice it. And afterwards, I tried to reach out to the family They said they'd like to come in and talk with me. But what I didn't know was that this was an ambush. As they came to the office, I invited them to sit down. They said, no, they didn't need to sit down for this. And they began just screaming. He just started yelling and yelling and cursing me and cursing the future of the ministry of the church. God will not bless this thing, he said. I thought he was going to hit me. He was just shaking, trembling with rage. I did manage to get in five words, which were, I do not see it that way, but that was it. That's six, isn't it? (laughs) Finally, they left. And I realized I felt angry because I would have been tricked to become the object of their pain, when really I didn't have anything to do with it. And then I thought, you know, this is one of the few times that I've actually, to my face, been cursed by someone. And as this week I went over the text again, I realized how much his hurt was speaking at that time. This couple was in so much pain. Their whole world had collapsed and they needed someone to blame. And I realized again that my reaction to them needs to be that I will pray for them and I will love them. I I spoke to a man who was in construction, who had one of those large yards, not out of a yard to his house, but place where he has all his lumber and all this metal and all this stuff. And he was closing it up when he heard noise in the back. And he got in his pickup and drove around to where the commotion was coming from. And there were three guys stealing an entire scaffolding from him. And when they saw him, they put a gun on him and kept loading the scaffolding into their truck. Well, as they did that, and as they loaded that scaffolding up, and as they were about done, he noticed something. He noticed that since they weren't uh, experienced in this sort of thing, they didn't know that they would have to load up the braces. If you don't have the braces with the scaffolding, you can put all up, then you get up there and it'll just collapse on you. 
And the question comes now, what do you do? I'm such a sinner that I might just let a little smile creep across my face and say, goodbye. But this guy says, no, wait a minute. You're going to need the braces, too. Now that's acting like a father who is in heaven. And that night, as they left that yard and did whatever they did, they, they may have still have been wicked, but they certainly should have been a little bit more grateful. And maybe they remembered years later that there was this guy who took care of them while they stole from him at gunpoint. At least I remember, and I'm telling you about it today. And that was his holy moment. What makes us remarkable is not that we give tit for tat. Everyone does that. What makes us remarkable is when we go the extra mile, as the parallel passage says in Matthew. What makes us remarkable is when we treat others better than they treat us. When, the recipro- when reciprocity is not upheld on their side, and yet we continue to treat them like family. As Jesus says, that is what makes us a little better than your everyday sinner. Well, our small group is just one small group from our church, I should say, just flash mobbed us with holy, holy, holy. The hymn, of course, is all about God's holiness. But there is one acknowledgement to how hard it is to view God's holiness. You know these lines, though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. At the throne room in Revelation, they cast their crowns down before his glory. But in this world, it's a little hard to see at times. So we are supposed to be the windows into the character of God. We are supposed to bear a family resemblance. Jesus is saying that our God is more than one who makes deals. He does not limit his grace. He does not cordon off his love. He forgives. He has loved us when we seemed to care less about him. When we were wicked and ungrateful, he treated us as he wanted to be treated. And when we live like that towards others, when we let Jesus guide us to love more, to be patient more, to even lend more, When the call comes for $700, when we exhibit his character, then that holiness that he has, it can be seen a little bit more clearly in this world. But as I have said, this is the hardest command. We all would rather see those movies about the bad guys getting it in the end. And here's the problem. According to Jesus, we have been that bad guy in relationship to God. Which brings us this morning to the communion table. The next time we share communion, it will be Monday, Thursday. That night, he was living out this very point. He came to love others. And others cursed him. Others hated him. He prayed for the very ones who struck him, not just on the cheek, but over the head and all over his body and across his back. And as for taking his cloak, he was robbed of everything down to his last garment that they gambled for. And as for lending without the chance of ever being repaid. Is there a better way to describe our salvation where he has lent his life so that we might live? He gave us his righteousness without any hope of repayment. So as we share in this meal, remember that he has already reached out to a few ungrateful and wicked people. He invited them to this table. And here we are. He didn't pay $700 for the privilege. He paid everything 
so that we might know God's love in this world and we might pass it along to others so that the darkness may not hide him, but rather we would reveal his loving heart to others, to the good guys and the bad guys, that heaven's mercy might be seen in this world. And so with that in mind, Jesus came together with his disciples. And the Bible says, after the supper, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so remembering me. So that now whenever we take this bread or drink from this cup, we proclaim the death of our Lord until he comes again. And I ministering in his name offer you this bread and this cup that they might be for you the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so bring nourishment to your soul. May we pray. Lord God, we are honored to be at table with you. We who have sometimes been ungrateful and even wicked, we come to you now, God, with thanks for all you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God, you did this miracle in a sense of taking common things and setting them aside for an uncommon purpose. It's just bread and juice. And we ask that you would keep doing that miracle, but not with bread and juice, but with men and women, with each of us, that we would be set aside for an uncommon purpose to reflect you in this world, to walk with you in this world, to be your children in this world. So God, now we give to you some of our resources that that reflection might shine brighter and brighter and you might be seen as Lord of all. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Usually we do a benediction, we all hold hands, but I'd like y'all to stand up now and to reach out, those close touch us and those everyone touch them on the back till we're all one big radiating circle. Lord God, in the face of loss, we pray your peace. In the face of heartbreak, we pray your blessing. We lift up Susan, and we lift up her family, and we lift up her grandniece. And God, we pray that we all would not be driven by hatred, by fear, by hurt, but by your love to everyone else, whether they are grateful or ungrateful, whether they are wicked or good, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.